So in this lecture, I want to present some applications of the Hanbagnac theorem. The problem, the first problem which I want to consider, it's called the moment problem. And it can be formulated as follows. You fix a sequence gamma k of real numbers and an interval a, b, finite interval in R. And you want to find a measure, mu, which is a sine measure and finite, such that the integral from a, b of t to the power k mu dt to be equal to gamma k for all k. So you want to find, given this sequence, a finite sine measure mu, which satisfies this identity for all k. And this is called the moment problem. To solve this problem, uh, I will use two tools, which I want to recall before we enter into um, this problem. The first one are the Lagrange polynomials. So we have the same interval a, b, and say that, well, it's closed, and you fix inside this a, b endpoints. So a, which can be, let's work on t0, smaller than t1, up to Tn, and this is less or equal than B. And what um, Ragrange proved in the 18th century is that you can find a family of polynomials phi j, so j between 0 and n, so this is n, of degree less or equal than n, so all these polynomials, these n plus 1 polynomials, have the degree less or equal than n. And they have the following property, is that if you compute phi j, so this polynomial j, at the point tk, this is 1 if j is equal to k, and if it's 0 otherwise. So these polynomials, which are used for interpolations, have the following property, you fixed endpoints, and uh, what Lagrange proves is that you can find n plus one, so you fix, sorry, n plus one points, you can find n plus one polynomials of degree less or equal than n with the following property. Well, the polynomial phi j will vanish at all points but one, say at point tj, and at point tj it will be equal to one. So this is the first tool which I will use in order to prove this moment problem. And then the second tool, it's uh, one in which we already mentioned in this lecture, is that if you consider the space of continuous function taking real values and defined in the interval a, b, you call this x, this is a Banach space with the uniform norm, well, you can show that the dual of this space is given by the finite sign measures. So dual space of x is the set of all measure mu which are finite and signed. So recall if you have such a measure mu, the hand decomposition tells you that mu can be written by as a difference of two non-negative measures, mu plus and mu minus, and you will define the norm of mu as the sum of mu plus of the interval a, b plus mu minus of the interval a, b. So this is a Banach space with this norm, and what's important here is that you can associate to each measure 
finite measure with a sign, a function defined on AB, which has bounded variation. So this is associated to uh, functions of bounded variation functions rho. And in the way in which uh, they are associated is as follows. Well, rho t will be equal to a constant plus the integral from a to t of mu ds, which means that rho t is the measure of the interval a t close to t. So let me write that as mu of a t. So given a measure with a sign and which is a finite, rho t defined by this formula, constant plus the measure of the, uh, this interval, it's a bounded variation function. And conversely, if you are given a bounded variation function, you can define a measure through uh, this formula. So this formula will define the measure on your uh, semi-algebra, and then by using Carateridori um, extension theorem, you can construct a measure on the uh, Borel sigma algebra through uh, this definition for in the semi-algebra. So these are the two tools which I shall use. The first one are these Lagrange polynomial. The second one is this characterization of um, the dual of the space of continuous function, which is also called the ries kakutani uh, theorem. So let's start with uh, a simpler problem, which is as follows. I fix n larger than 1, and I fix gamma k, a sequence, a finite sequence from 0 to n of real numbers. And I want to find uh, mu, which is a finite sign measure on the interval AB. So the interval AB is also fixed. Such that the interval from A to B of t to the power k mu dt, it's equal to gamma k for all k between 0 and n. And what I claim is that you can always solve this problem. So you can always find mu such that um, this identity holds for all k. And the proof, so you can try to prove it by yourself, is as follows. Well, let me represent by pk the continuous function in AB. And here k is larger than 0, which is given by, so pk of t, it's just t to the power k. So this is the definition of pk. Now let me define yn. So yn is the uh, space generated by pk for k between 0 and n. So this is the space, the linear space, generated by p0, pn. And this is a finite, uh, finite dimensional linear space. So yn. It's a subspace of the space of continuous function, and it has dimension n plus 1. So it's a finite dimensional linear space of the space of continuous functions defined on A, B. Now what I want to do is to define a linear bounded functional on Y, N, and then extend it to um, the old space. So if you have u in yn, I want to define L of u. So what uh, we shall do, it's u belongs to yn, so it belongs to the linear span. So u can be written as a sum from 0 up to n of constants a, k, p, k. And, well, all elements of yn can be written this way. So what I will define, I will define L of u as the sum from 0 to n of a, k, 
and L of pk, I want it to be gamma k. So this is the definition of a functional from yn to r. Now, what I claim is that L is linear and bounded. Well, linearity is obvious by its definition. So I leave it to you to check that L is linear. What I want to prove next is that L is bounded. To prove that L is bounded, actually what we will do is to show that L is continuous. So we introduce this finite dimensional space Yn and linear functional on Yn, which is given defined as follows. If u is an element of Yn, it's a linear combination of the functions pk. pk, remember, it's the polynomial t to the power k. And L of u will be simply ak times gamma k. Now I want to prove that L is continuous. To prove that L is continuous, let me fix a sequence up in yn. And let me assume that up is converging to some u for the L infinity norm. So remember that we are working on the space of continuous functions. So we have here a sequence of continuous functions which belong to yn, which is converging to y in the L infinity norm. And what I want to prove is that L of y up, so what I want to show is that L of up converge to L of u, as p tends to plus infinity. Well, so let me at this point use the Lagrange polynomials. So remember, we have phi j, j between 0 and n. And where I fixed here points between 0 and b. So let me fix n plus 1 points, t0 and tn, from a to b. And let me represent by phi j the Lagrange polynomial, which has the property that phi j at tk is equal to 1 if j is equal to k, and 0 otherwise. So from this definition, it's clear that these polynomials, well, they have all degree less or equal than n. So they belong to yn. And from this um, property, it's easy to show that they are linearly independent. So you can write any element of yn in terms of these polynomials. So in particular, let me write up as a combination of these polynomials. So that will be sum from 0 to uh, n of b, p, j, phi j. So since up belongs to yn, and since um, I have here a family of linearly independent, so this family it's actually a basis of yn. So I can represent up in terms of this basis. These are the coefficients. Well, now let me use this property to check that if I place here, I compute this identity at t equal to tk, that will be 0 for all terms, but 1 for the term uh, j equal to k. So what I get is that up at tk is equal to b p k. So I have a formula for b p k, and this allows me to write. So maybe um, let me continue here. So I have that u p of t is given by the sum from j from 0 up to n of u p at t j phi j of t. And in the same way, since u uh, y n is closed, u belongs to y n. And therefore, um, u also can be represented as the sum.
Now, I'm assuming that up converges to u in the L infinity norm. This means that up of t converges to u of t for all t. And since uh, this is true, this tells me that L of UP, so L of UP, remember, I have here the formula. This is, I'm writing um, by linearity, L of UP, it's given by this formula, so it's the sum. So here I'm using linearity of L in Yn and this identity. So I'm taking L of Up. Since Up is a linear combination of these phi j's, L of Up is equal to the sum of Up tj of L of phi j. And in the same way, L of U is equal to the sum of u of tj l of phi j. Now, as I was saying, up is converging to u in the L infinity norm, which means that up of tj converges to u of tj for all j, or u of p of t converges to u of t for all t. So this means that these uh, as p tends to infinity, this up of tj converges to u of tj. These are fixed numbers, and therefore this sum is converging to that one, which proves that L of up is converging to L of u, which is proving that L is indeed continuous, because I took a sequence up in yn converging to u, and I proved that L of up converges to L of u. So this proves the claim, and we have seen that a linear functional, which is continuous, it's bounded. So now I have, at this point, defined by this formula, a bounded linear functional L on Yn. So up to this point, I defined this functional on Yn, which is given by this formula. So if u is an element of Yn, it can be decomposed on the basis Pk, and I'm defining L of u as a k gamma k, the sum of that. Now I prove that L is bounded and linear. So why n is a linear subspace of the space of continuous function? So Han Banach tells me that I can find an extension of L. So there exists a bounded linear functional L, which is defined on the space of continuous function, and which is an extension, which means that L of u is equal to L of u for all u in y. So since L is bounded and linear, L belongs to the dual of the space of continuous function, and we have seen that the dual of this space is the space of finite sign measures. So I have a representation of L as the integral of ut mu dt, where mu is a finite signed measure. So this is just by uh, the identification of the dual of the space of continuous function as the space of finite signed measures. Well, no, now let's see what uh, this identity is telling us. Let's take u as p of k. p of k indeed belongs for k between 0 and n indeed belongs to the space yn. And so this is telling us that on the one hand, L of pk 
since pk belongs to yn, this is small l of pk. And by this formula, this means that, well, all the a's are equal to 0, but, so let me call that uh, maybe 0. So all k's ak are equal to 0, but k ak 0, it's 1. So l of pk 0 by this formula is just gamma k 0. And on the other hand, by the representation theorem, this is equal to the integral from a b of pk naught t, but pk naught t is t to the power k naught mu dt. So indeed, this measure, this finite sign measure, satisfies the conditions of uh, the, pro the proposition or the lemma we wanted to prove. We just have seen, we have just constructed using Han Banach that uh, indeed there exists a finite sign measure mu such that the integral of t to the power k with respect to that measure, it's equal to the sequence gamma k from which we started. So what we just proved is that if I give you any sequence gamma 0 up to gamma n of real numbers, I can find a finite set sign measure for which this identity holds for all k's between 0 and n. So in the finite case, it's fine. So now uh, I want to consider the second problem in which instead of taking a finite sequence, we take an infinite sequence and we want to impose conditions on this infinite sequence to ensure the existence of a finite sign measure which satisfies this infinite uh, sequence of equations. So here's the formulation of the second problem. Again, I started with a finite interval AB and a sequence gamma k. And my question is, I want to prove the existence of a finite signed measure mu defined on the interval a, b, such that the integral from a to b of t to the power k mu dt, it's equal to gamma k, and this for all k larger than 0. And here is the uh, proposition which I want to prove. So the proposition reads as follow. There exists a solution of this problem if and only if for all n larger than 1, say, and for all a1, a0, a n, the following holds. The sum from k from 0 to n of a k gamma k, that this is bounded by the l-infinity norm of, so if there exists a constant, finite constant c, such that this is bounded by this finite constant c times the infinity norm of a k tk. So what I claim is that there exists a solution to this problem if and only if the following condition holds. There exists a finite constant which has the following property for any n and for any a0, a n, these are real numbers, the sum of a k gamma k, where gamma k is the fixed sequence, it's bounded by this constant times the L infinity norm of the following uh, continuous function, the function which is a k times t to the power k sum over k. So this is uh, the proposition which I want to prove. So let's first prove that if there exists a solution, then uh, indeed there exists a constant. So assume that there exists a solution. If there exists uh, a solution, then k 
from 0 to n of a k gamma k, which we want to bound. Well, gamma k is given by this expression. So I can replace gamma k by this expression since I'm assuming that there exists a solution. So this is the integral from a to b of the sum from 0 to n of a k t to the power k d mu of t. And now we have here a continuous function which is integrated with respect to a finite sign measure. And so we know that this is bounded by the L infinity norm of the function. times the total variation of the measure mu, which I'm representing by that. So this is the norm, as I explained. Mu, it's a finite sign measure, so it can be decomposed as uh, the difference of two non-negative measures. And this is the sum of the mass of the two uh, non-negative measures. So since we have this bound, this is exactly what uh, is stated on the right-hand side. We obtained this finite constant such that for any n and for any sequence a k, k going from 0 to n, this quantity is bounded by this constant times the L infinity norm of this function. So if there exists a solution, indeed, we can find this constant. And now uh, we will prove the converse statement. So I erased everything to have some space. Here is the assumption. So we know there exists a C, the finite constant, such that for all n and for all vector a, we have that inequality. And what we want to prove is that there exists a finite sign measure mu, such that this identity holds for all k. So uh, let's prove this statement. So now let me define y as the space spanned by the P0, P1, and so on. So remember that PK of T, it's T to the power K. And just a, a remark, this will be used later, that Y, so it's a linear subspace of the space of continuous function on AB, and that it, Y it's dense. Now, um, let me take an element u in y. So all the elements of y can be written as finite linear combinations of p0, p1, pk. So this implies that y, u is equal to the sum from 0 to n of certain a, j, t, j. This is uh, the definition of the linear span. And now I want to define a linear functional on y, taking values on r. So take q in y. u can be written this way. So I will define L of u as the sum of aj gamma j. Now it's clear, so this is saying that L of tj is equal to gamma j. Now it's clear uh, from the definition that L is linear. If you take two elements, u and v, it's clear that L of u plus v is equal to L of u plus L of v. So what I claim is that L is bounded. And this is exactly where this condition appears. So let me take u. So L of u, u it's um, given by this expression. So L of u is equal to the sum of aj gamma j. And uh, by assumption, so the absolute value, it's given by the absolute value of that sum. 
And by assumption, this sum, so this is bounded, so there exists a finite constant C for which this is bounded by this L infinity norm, but the function which appears in the L infinity norm, it's exactly U. So this condition is telling you that this is bounded by a constant, so I can even write it here, this is bounded by a constant times U L infinity. So what we get is that indeed L, it's a bounded functional, and its norm, it's bounded by this constant C. So now we have a bounded linear functional defined on the dense subspace. So we can extend L to a linear functional, bounded linear function L, which is defined on C. So L, it's a bounded linear functional, but now defined on all space C, and L coincides with small l on y. So again, we can use the Ries representation theorem to tell us that this bounded linear functional can be represented through a finite sign measure. So there exists mu, which is a finite sign measure, such that L of u, it's equal to the integral from A to B of ut mu dt. But now, if we plug in this identity u equal to t to the power j, so if I take now u equal to t to the power j, on the left-hand side, since t to the power j belongs to y, this is equal to L of tj. And by definition, L of tj is equal to gamma j. And on the other hand, if I plug ut to be t to the power j, what I get here is the integral of t to the power j mu t. And therefore, this identity, it's exactly the one we were uh, trying to prove. So this completes the proof of the moment problem by using just uh, Han Banach. So here is a third application, problem three, which is uh, Chebyshev approximation of polynomials. So again, we fix an interval a, b. I consider an element of the space of continuous function in AB, let's say U. I define YN to be the space generated by the polynomials T0, T to the power 1, and T to the power N. So YN is the all polynomials of degree less or equal than n. And what I want to consider is the following variational problem. I want to minimize u, which is this function. Let me call maybe that u0, u0 in, with u in yn. Okay. So I want to approximate in the L infinity norm a continuous function by polynomials. And what I want to claim is that there exists a solution to this problem. So there exists a u in yn which minimizes um, this, which solves this variational problem. And that, and uh, what I really want to prove is that if you take the points t such that ut minus u0 of t reaches, attains its maximum, then what I claim is that there are at least n plus two points in which this happens. So you consider, so you solve this problem, I claim that there exists a solution. 
Now you consider the function u minus u0. So this is a continuous function. So it has a maximum. It attains its maximum at least at one point. What I claim is that, uh, remember that n is fixed, that this continuous function, which is non-negative, attains its maximum at at least n plus two points. And this is what I want to prove as an application of Han Banach. So in order to prove this problem, let me first state a lemma. So let me represent by, um, so I fixed an interval AB. Let me consider T in AB. Delta T will be an element, so of X prime. So X is the space of continuous bounded of continuous function defined on the interval AB. So X star its dual. Delta T, it's a bounded linear functional, which at U, it's given by U of T. Now, let's assume that we have, so here's the statement of the lemma. These were notation. I'm taking L in X, X star, so in the dual, and I'm assuming that there exists U in X such that L of U is equal to the norm of L times the norm of U. So, of course, here I'm assuming that L is different from uh, zero. So I'm assuming first that um, U of X, there exists a U such that this identity holds. And I'm assuming now that U of T, so the maximum of U of T, it's attained at n points, say t1 up to tn. What I claim is that there exist alpha 1 and alpha n with the following property. L is equal to the sum alpha j delta tj from 1 to n, and the sum of the absolute values of the alpha j, it's equal to the norm of L. So let me read again this lemma. So I'm fixing a bounded linear functional on the space of continuous functions. So an element of x prime, which is non-trivial. And I'm assuming that, well, there is a continuous function u such that L of u is equal to the norm of L times the norm of u. Now consider the function, this function u. We know that u of t, uh, the maximum of u of t is attained at a certain number of points. So I am assuming that this maximum is attained exactly at n points, at these points t1 up to tn. So I'm assuming that this maximum is attained at a finite number of points, a fixed finite number of points, n points. Then what I claim is that if this is the case, then I can find alpha 1, alpha n, so these are real numbers, such that L is actually a linear combination of these bounded linear functionals delta, delta tj actually. Moreover, if I sum the absolute values of alpha j, I get the norm of L. So I will prove this lemma in order to prove, in order to solve the Chebyshev variational problem. So let's prove uh, this lemma. So L, it's an element of x, the dual of x, and we know by Ries representation theorem that there exists a finite signed measure such that L of u 
it's equal to, or L of, let me take another function, V, it's equal to the integral from A to B of VT mu DT. And I can also write this as, well, we know that any finite sign measure, it's associated to a bounded variation function. So let me write that as VT um, DT D rho T, where rho it's a finite uh, bounded variation function. So that we know because we have a representation of the dual space. So this holds for all V. Now let's assume um, that U is a continuous function which satisfies this identity. And let's assume that the maximum value is attained at one point. So let's assume for the moment that n is equal to 1, you'll see that the argument for 1 applies to uh, any finite number. And uh, what we want to consider is, let's call uh, t1, so the value at which u of t assume its maximum. Let's fix some epsilon positive, and let's look at an interval around t1. So t1 minus epsilon, t1 plus epsilon, b and a. And, well, so what I claim is now that I will consider the total variation of this, um, the function rho in this interval a, b by considering its total variation on the interval a, t1 minus epsilon, T1 minus epsilon, T1 plus epsilon, T1 plus epsilon B. So there are two possibilities. Let's first assume that for all epsilon positive, the total variation of the function rho in the interval A or A T1 minus epsilon plus the total variation of the function rho in the interval t1 plus epsilon b, that this is equal to 0. So I'm assuming here that whatever epsilon, if I look at the total variation of the function rho in the interval a t1 minus epsilon, and the total variation of the function rho on t1 plus epsilon b, that this total variation is equal to 0. This means that the function rho, it's constant up to uh, t1, and then it's constant from t1 uh, on. This means, so if this condition holds, this means that the function rho t, so let's assume that uh, rho at a is equal to 0, or, well, this, is, this means that rho of t is equal to rho of a, which I will assume without loss of generality that this is equal to 0 for t between a and t1. And that rho t is equal to rho of b for t in t1 b. So this means that if the total variation of this function is zero on these two interval, this means that rho is actually a um, jump function, which is constant up to t1. At t1, it jumps, and then it's constant from t1 to b. So there is a jump, and this means that the measure associated to rho, so if you want the finite sign measure associated to this bounded variation function, is just some constant times the Dirac measure at t1. So if this condition holds, we know exactly what is the measure mu t, and therefore we know that L of v is equal to um, vt1 times a constant. And this holds for all v.
Well, this is exactly what uh, we wanted to prove, right? We wanted to prove, remember that I'm assuming that n is equal to 1. If n is equal to 1, we wanted to show that L is a linear combination of these Dirac bounded linear functionals. So this we proved. So what, what remains to be checked is that this identity holds, but this identity follows from this condition and this equality. So we know that L of u, which is equal of u t1, so this is u of t1 times c by this identity, and uh, I, have, I don't have the absolute values. So this is equal to u t1 times c, and this is equal to the norm of L times the norm of u, but I'm assuming that u assumes its maximum at t1, so this is u of t1. So you get from uh, this identity, if I take now the absolute value on both sides, that the norm of L times ut1, it's equal to ut1 times c, and therefore that the absolute value of c, it's equal to the norm of L, and this is exactly this identity. So we proved uh, the lemma under the assumption that n is equal to 1 and the assumption that the total variation of the bounded variation function rho in the intervals a t1 minus epsilon and t1 plus epsilon b is equal to 0. So let's keep the assumption that n is equal to 1. So there is 1 point t1, and we are looking at t1 minus epsilon, t1 plus epsilon, a, b. But now I will assume that there exists an epsilon positive such that, well, the total variation of rho, say, in the interval a, t1 minus epsilon, say that this is positive. Okay? We'll see that, well, the same argument can be applied to uh, the right uh, interval t1 plus epsilon b. So in previously, I assumed that the total variation was strictly equal to 0 for all epsilon. Now I'm assuming that there exists an epsilon such that the total variation is strictly positive. So let me look at L of u. Why I'm looking at L of u? Because I know that L of u is exactly equal to the norm of L times the norm of u, and the norm of u is equal to u of t1, where t1 is the only point in which uh, the absolute value of u of t assumes its maximum. So I want to find a contradiction. Okay? I want to find that, I want to show that uh, this identity is impossible if there is a total variation, a strictly positive total variation. Okay, I want to find a contradiction. So L of u, by definition, is given by this interval, this interval from a, b of u, t, rho, d, t. Now I want to cut this interval in three pieces. So that will be from a to t1 minus epsilon, u of t rho dt, plus t1 minus epsilon, t1 plus epsilon, u t rho dt, and plus the third piece. I want to now estimate each of these terms. L of u, well, it's the total, it's the norm of L, but the norm of L, it's the total variation. So it's, this is u times the total variation of our function rho. Now, ut is continuous 
it assumes its maximum at T1. So I want to estimate this object by the L infinity norm of U in this interval A T1 minus epsilon times the total variation of rho in this interval. But since U assumes its unique maximum at T1, the L infinity norm in this interval is strictly smaller than U of T1. So this is strictly smaller than U of T1 times the total variation of rho in this interval in A rho 1 minus epsilon. T1, I'm sorry. So let me write this more clearly. So here I'm taking the total variation of the function rho in the interval A T1 minus epsilon. And now I can just bound the other pieces by the L infinity norm of U times the total variation between T1 minus epsilon and B plus U times the total variation of rho in the interval T1 minus epsilon B. But mind, this is strictly smaller. And when I, well, this is norm of u, this is norm of u, and what I get here is that, so this is equal to the norm of u times the total variation of rho in the interval a, b. And this is the norm of L. So this is the norm of u times the norm of the bounded linear functional L. And therefore, we get a contradiction because we get that u times the total variation of rho is strictly smaller than u times the total variation of rho. Which means that, indeed, if the total variation in this interval is not zero, we get a contradiction from this identity. Which means that, well, rho has to be a step function, which is constant, then it jumps, then it's constant. And it's clear that you can extend that for any finite number n. You just will show that the total variation inside any of these intervals has to be equal to zero, and that rho is actually a step function which has steps exactly at the points in which u of t attains its maximum. So I leave it to you uh, to complete the details, which is based on this contradiction and on the previous argument. And therefore, um, I, I will assume that we have proved this lemma and used this result in order to solve Chebyshev's problem. So I kept on the right-hand side of the blackboard um, the lemma we just proved. And on the left-hand side, I just recall what we want to show. We fixed the continuous function. Yn is the linear space spanned by the polynomials up to the degree n. And we want to uh, minimize, so we want to approximate this continuous function u naught by a polynomial of degree less or equal than n. We want to show that this, um, this variational problem has a solution and that the function u minus u0 attains a maximum at at least n plus two points. So the proof of this claim goes in two steps. Well, first we observe that yn is a finite dimensional space. And on finite dimensional space, you can always solve, you can always prove that there exists a y which uh, minimizes this distance. So there exists a y in yn such that y minus y0 is equal to the infimum. So this is just uh, from the fact that yn is a finite dimensional space. 
Boltzmann, uh, well, I have to, of course, if u0 belongs to yn, there's nothing to prove. You take u equal to y0, and this function mu minus y0 attains its maximum at all points, so this is clearly satisfied. So I can assume that u0 actually does not belong to uh, yn. So let's assume that u0 doesn't belong. If this is the case, now we can find, so in one of the theorems on um, dual space, we proved that we could find a bounded linear function on L defined on all space, x, with uh, the following properties. So L of u minus u0, mind, since u belongs, so let me call u star this function which minimize. So this one belongs to yn, since u0 doesn't belong to yn, u star minus u0 does not belong to yn. So we can find the bounded linear functional such that this is equal to the norm of u star minus y0, that the norm of L of this bounded linear functional is equal to 1, and that L vanish on yn. So this is a general term which we proved. We proved that um, we can find one bounded linear function. We could construct one bounded linear function using Han Banach such that L applied at this point, it's exactly the norm of u star minus u zero. The norm of L is equal to one. And L of pk, it's um, equal to zero for k between zero and n because L vanish at the uh, linear space yn. Now let's consider the function u star minus u0, and let's assume that it attains its maximum at m points, where m is strictly smaller than n plus 2, so m it's less or equal than n plus 1. So assuming that uh, this function u star minus u0 attains its maximum at exactly m points, and m is less or equal than n plus 1, so I want to find a contradiction because I want to prove that m has to be larger or equal than n plus 2. Well, so now, uh, you see, I have here a bounded linear functional, which has norm equal to 1, and such that L at this point is equal to this norm. So this condition here of the lemma is satisfied. And then I'm saying also that this function attains its maximum at m points. So by the previous lemma, what I get is that this linear functional, L, its equal can be written as a sum from uh, 0 to n of aj delta tj. So I know that L can be written this way, and that this, um, I'm here, I'm sorry, I am have m points. So it attains at maximum at m points. And moreover, I have the, the sum it's equal to the norm of L. Now I want to get a contradiction out of um, this condition. Now, since this sum is equal to uh, J to the norm of L, and L does not vanish, actually L has norm equal to one, there exists at least one AG which does not vanish. 
So let's assume without generality that AM is different from 0. Now, assume that M is less or equal than N plus 1. So this means that M minus 1 is less or equal than N. So N is larger than M minus 1. And this means that I can find a polynomial P in Yn such that P at Tj, so at T1, it's equal to P at Tm minus 1, which is 0. So I'm imposing M condition to this polynomial P. And that P at Tm to be 1. And this is possible while well, I'm imposing m conditions on this polynomial. So I need its degree to be at, mo at least m minus 1. But n, it's larger than m minus 1. So this is fine. So there exists such a polynomial. And now, if I compute l to this polynomial p, well, from this formula, what I get is that, well, since p by linearity, this is Ag delta Tj at P, but this is P of Tj, but P of Tj is 0 unless J is equal to M. So this is equal to Am times P at Tm, but P at Tm is 1. So I get that L of P is equal to Am. And this is a contradiction because I know that L vanish at Yn. So L at Pk is equal to 0, so L vanish at all polynomials of degree less or equal than n. P belongs to Yn, and we just obtain that L of P is Am, which is different from 0. So indeed, if this function attains maximum at m points for m less or equal than n plus 1, we get a contradiction. So m has to be at least n plus 2, as claimed by uh, the Chebyshev theorem. And this completes the proof of the theorem.